I enjoyed it thoroughly when we got our new kit. I loved the color of that kit. And when I got our track suits, they were beautiful as well. It was something very different. It was something very festive for me as a player, something very new for me as a player, and I suppose for every team as well. Melbourne Cricket Ground, one of the most iconic sports venues in the world and host of the 1992 Cricket World Cup Final between England and Pakistan. What a magnificent start to this marvellous day of cricket, the World Cup Final 1992. The MCG staged the final match of a Cricket World Cup that had been dramatic and exciting. Closely fought matches, spectators in tens of thousands, and innovations that catapulted cricket into the modern day era. Well, it was cricket entertainment, wasn't it? It was cricket appealing to the masses, the white ball, the black sight screens, it was colour, it was, it was palladium. It was fantastic. It's what cricket needed, and it delivered. It's on the crowd! Crowds were great. That's uh, what both of them are here for. Uh, there were some good matches. Oh, brilliantly caught! In Australia, New Zealand, one of the best places, in my opinion, in my opinion, to play cricket. The 1992 World Cup had everything. It even had a decent song. Who will it be? Who will be the king? It's a once in a lifetime chance. Who will rule the world? Gotta see who will rule the world. It was the Cricket World Cup that changed the one day game. Innovations to make the matches more exciting, more competitive, and easy on the eye for the players and fans alike. The interest uh, that was created uh, was massive, where the interest for the game just took off and it went through the roof. Whenever we see the footage, uh, yeah, you, you start feeling, yeah, that was a great time. The fifth Cricket World Cup launched facets of the game known and loved today. Coloured clothing, white cricket balls, black side screens and day-night matches. The tournament held for the first time in Australia and New Zealand truly had a feeling of something different. It was very exciting for me. As a young cricketer, getting into the World Cup with white balls, colour clothing, and with black side screen. It took me some time to get uh, used to the white balls, to control the white balls, because they swing a lot more than the red ball, especially first 15 to 20 overs. Nine teams faced each other once in a round-robin group, with the top four teams progressing to semi-finals and eventual final. Expectations were high for the hosts Australia, who were the reigning champions having won in India in 1987. The current holders of the World Cup it. back here again, and there is on the float one of Australia's all-time greats, Richie Benno. Well, the World Cup is the, the pinnacle uh, tournament for uh, all cricketers uh, globally. Um, it's a chance for us all to come together and um, perform for our countries against all the best players from uh, all the other countries. India was also amongst the favourites, having won the Cricket World Cup nine years earlier on English soil. Four years previously, their showing was also strong at the 1987 Cricket World Cup. Expectations were high. Having won the World Cup once, they had actually taken to one-day cricket. They made changes, they thought they had a good young team. They had Tendulka then, young Tendulka coming up, Azruddin as captain and so on, and they were really quite confident going to Australia. England arrived with a strong and experienced squad with strength in both batting and bowling. Pakistan were led by Imran Khan and his steely determination to succeed during the final chance of his career. Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe were the new emerging nations, and then there was South Africa, reinstated into international cricket after the end of apartheid in 1990. I would led the fight to keep them out of it, but now that we'd seen the end of apartheid and I had genuine 
Democratic government there. It was marvellous to see them back in the fold and they've always been a significant force in world cricket since. South Africa was led by Kepler Vessels, who'd played 24 tests for Australia during the apartheid era. He joined a short list of cricketers to play for two countries. It was a big build up to that uh, 92 World Cup because we knew quite a long time before we actually went that, that we were going to go, so uh, there was an, an, an enormous build up and uh, quite a tense build up, I must admit. The fact that we were there after 27 years of sporting isolation was almost good enough, and in a way that took pressure off us, so for us to perform was just a bonus. This was the Cricket World Cup played as a league, with all nine teams facing each other once in the qualifying round-robin stage. First up in the opening game were the hosts, Australia and New Zealand, playing at a packed Eden Park. New Zealand won the toss and chose to bat, getting off to the worst possible start. I bowled him! He bowled him too wide and he struck. That looked to me as if that ball hit the inside of the bat and then came back onto the stumps. The alarm bells hadn't rung with me um, in the lead-up. Really, the fact that, um, hang on, we're playing New Zealand in New Zealand, uh, you know, we could get hijacked here. At 3 for 53, New Zealand was struggling and needed inspiration from their captain, Martin Crowe, and he delivered. So read back. And he's got it down between two fielders. Martin Crowe is, is one of the great cricket thinkers. One of the few people that I've known in cricket who can see into the future. Crow introduced spin with the new ball and then Great Batch uh, was introduced as a pinch hitter against the new balls. Crow's batting, so organised technically but so adaptable, so able to play one day cricket as instinctively as he was to play test match cricket pragmatically. Oh what a glorious shot. Crow fought the Australian attack but his partners fell regularly during this extraordinary innings. As New Zealand approached 200, a Chris Harris run-out could have jeopardised their chances. Oh, a chance of a run-out is gone. The Harris, good thinking by Crow, he kept coming. Once again, it's border at a cover position, makes a great save. And another run-out, this time, Chris Harris. We knew that uh, man for man, they were probably a better cricket team than us. They'd proven that time and time again. But we also knew that we had Eden Park up our sleeve. New Zealand still had Martin Crowe at the crease, who kept on coming at Australia, and with 99 on the board, he gave the home crowd at Eden Park what they wanted, a century. He's on 99, wars the bowler, and he's got it away. That's 100 for Ken, that's 100 for Crowe, and they're off to the ground, oh no! Your best batsman should face as many deliveries as possible, in all honesty, and that way he can control the game, and he was our controller. He had that ability just to work the ball around. He ran well between the wickets. You know, here, here was the real package. New Zealand's score of 248 gave Australia a real challenge, thanks mainly to Martin Crowe's master class. He made sure it wasn't about an individual hundred. It was making sure that we got a credible total to say to Australia, are you good enough? As Australia began their innings, Martin Crowe unleashed his off-spinner Dipak Patel to open the bowling, a surprise tactic in one-day cricket. Look, it was a fantastic uh, innovation that uh, Martin Crowe and, and, and Warren Lees came up with. It was certainly very unexpected. Here with his right arm off-spinner. Martin Crowe as captain of New Zealand it was the first innovative captain that bowled a spinner to open the bowling. And that sort of took a couple of overs to get used to. What do we do here? Do we attack him? Do we murk him around? What, what? We've never seen this before. Australia's openers began well, but Jeff Marsh was dismissed with the score on 62. Good bowling by Larson. Marsh going for the drive, went to play, he died forward. When you're losing wickets, it's difficult in one day cricket um, because every time that happens, your, your momentum slows again. Dean Jones then stepped in, adding 30 runs quickly to mount pressure on New Zealand. That uh, has picked up the run rate for Australia there. Jonesy, you know, who was our go-to man really and won that cricket, uh, he played well. Uh, unfortunately got himself out and then of course we hit a bit of a submerged log from there. Dean Jones looking to put the pressure on the New Zealand fielders. The short boundary and he's in trouble. He's on his way. 
Dean Jones tried to take on the fielder there. Australia did not look comfortable and soon lost their captain, Alan Border. Alan Border does take some risks here. There's a fieldsman in the outfield. He's come around, taken the catch. We just um, you know, put too much pressure on ourselves by losing wickets in the middle order. I never blame the tail uh, when you get into those circumstances. It's more, you know, what should have been done. We got a, a reasonable start at the top of the order. The middle order just fell away, of which I was one, so I've got to put my hand up. Down but not out, David Boone kept Australia's hopes alive with an excellent 100. There's his century. It's been a very good innings for Australia. Another fine innings from David Boone. Whilst you've always got a gritty little player like David Boone at the crease, you're always worried because in one day cricket you need one guy to stay and you can bat around him and, and Boone, he set himself the task of doing that. But with Australia on 200, Boone was run out by Chris Harris and New Zealand sensed an upset. The ball is another chance for a run out of the direct hit and there it is. Another wicket for New Zealand. That's Boone. That's where the game you know, changed. We felt comfortable after that. Uh, once we got Boone out, we felt that uh, you know, we could go in and win. They put the pressure on our, our tail, uh, which they, we left them too much to do. So. Uh, you can't blame them for you know, the, the wickets falling you know, in, a, in a rush at the end. In the air, and that's gone. So may well be Australia. Reid has hit it in the air. That's the end of the game. That's it. New Zealand has won. A surprise victory here, and 30,000 New Zealand supporters, well, a fair percentage of them, are going to make a dash to congratulate their team as they head off the ground. It was euphoric. Inside the dressing room it was, wow, do we just sort of do that? You know, have we just caused the biggest upset of the World Cup on day one? A great tournament opener, which set the precedent for a month of dramatic and exciting cricket action for both players and fans across the world. It was great, it was just exciting, you know what I mean? In Australia, uh, day-night cricket, floodlights. It's gone again, it could be six, that's a big long hit. We were happy to wear anything that was representing South Africa. We weren't fussy. I think these days the guys are, must be tight fitting and this and that. They, we just wanted to play. It was something very different. It was something very festive for me as a player. It was fun all around. The 1992 Cricket World Cup started with the defeat of Australia by New Zealand in Auckland. A day later, England was up against India and expectations were high for both sides. For one cricket legend, the tournament's new formats and innovations were improving the spectacle of the game. That's uh, what Bokum's here for, from England's point of view, to get things moving in the first 15 overs. One day cricket is different to test cricket, so why shouldn't you be in the coloured uh, clothing, the white ball? And if you're going to play day and night games, which you did, the white ball makes so much sense. So, yeah, it was just another step in the direction. Some innovations were coming from the teams themselves, with players like Botham opening the batting as pinch hitters. I've been banging on the door to open for quite some time, and I felt that uh, batting at six, six down in the order, quite often you went in for the last couple of overs if you were playing well, and if you weren't, and you were playing badly as a number six gets used to, then you go out there and uh, you, you, you backs the wall stuff with the tail. So uh, I said I'd, I'd love to have a go. Um, I got the opportunity, I think it went pretty well. Against India, Botham was out for nine, but better results would come from his new role in England's next matches. It's a great shot there from Graham Gooch. Graham Gooch combined with Robin Smith in a 120-run partnership as England put the pressure on India. I remember Robin Smith hitting one of the biggest sixes I've ever seen. What massive hit is that? Robin Smith's innings of 91 was the cornerstone of England's final score of 236. England had made their statement. We got off to the start we wanted to. You know, India were a dangerous side, you know, they had some quality players, obviously Tendulkar was around then, and Kapil Dev played, you know, so you never know. 
India struck back with an opening partnership of 63 between Ravi Shastri and Chris Srikanth. Later, Sachin Tendulkar's impressive 35 made an important contribution to the innings. We were very much in patches. We didn't really play as well as we should have. We had the experience during that period. We had everything, but it just uh, wasn't coming on our side. That's very well bowled. Oh, now, and it's all over. Ian Botham doesn't take any chances, runs in, takes the bails off himself. It was a close finish with India's final score of 227, nine runs short of England's 236. India had looked tired, having been away from home for a considerable time. When you're three, three and a half months on a tour of Australia, you've not done that well in the Test match series, you know, you're plagued with injuries, you know, then uh, you can have problems. Uh, but having said that, you know, I still thought India, you know, had a pretty good team to go the distance. After that defeat, India recovered by beating Sri Lanka and then faced Australia at the Gabba in Brisbane in one of the most exciting matches so far in the tournament. Mark Taylor really finding the middle of the bat very early on. They look for three here. Have to hurry. Starting well, Kapil Dev struck early and had Australia on two for 31. Again, he's dragged the ball back onto his stumps. Winning the World Cup is you start playing well somewhere during the tournament. A David Boone and Dean Jones partnership steadied the Australian innings. The middle order providing a much needed recovery. A beautiful shot, that's a huge shakes over the ball. It's a magnificent shot. We went into the game now, it was a must win for us, so uh, you know we, we your planning and your preparation were as good as it can get. This was a match India had to win, but the pressure for Australia at home was also proving hard to handle. Oh, magnificent shot. Picked it up off the legs and really cooperative. Proven wicket. I don't think we went in there with huge confidence like we have done in other World Cups where we're thinking, you know, if we get it right, you know, there's not too many teams that can stand in our way. He's gone for that one, this is in the air, this could be out. It is, oh, brilliantly caught, absolutely magnificently caught by the DJ coming in there, and what a catch that is. With Australia on 235, Alan Border was Kapildev's third wicket, prompting a collapse of the Australian tail. The stumps do, so that's a run out. Walking off the ground, you, you sort of think, you know, we've made 237. You know, that, that's, that's a defendable score in, in my opinion at that ground. Yeah, you, you always walk off thinking, oh, I'd like a few more, but you, you're comfortable. In reply, India's openers Chris Srikanth and Ravi Shastri went cheaply. In partnerships with Sachin Tendulkar and Kapil Dev, the captain Mohammad Azharuddin settled the Indian innings and they started to look impressive. When you had such stars, uh, you know, like Azhar and, well, Kapil was there and of course uh, you had uh, Sachin who's, uh, you know, burst onto the international scene. So, yeah, there were certain expectations, but cricket is like that, you know, some days you're up and some days you're not. Later, Azharuddin went for 93. He was followed by Sanjay Mandraker, who'd made the Australian attack sweat before he went for 47. Coming back for the second, he's got to be out, surely. It's gone. Yes, good try by McDermott. They had to take it on. Sanjay Mandraker run out by a great throw by Craig McDermott. David Boone had the fails up in a flash, and that could be the end for India. Three to tie, a boundary will win it. It's cut that away, they'll have to run. Oh dear, oh dear, Smart not even running. So they run out, so that's virtually it. After Prabhaka was run out, the game went down to the last ball of the match. India needed four runs to win. Well, I, I suppose you, you, you're always uh, thinking that hitting a boundary, uh, that can be done. When he first hits it, you think, oh no. He's got it at six, got it be! He's coming around Mark Taylor, it's a steep wall! You know, you've got your part in your mouth hoping he takes the catch. He's done that! He's got to go back for the third, come on run! Good throw over the stumps. They're running! Oh, it's a goal! They win by one run, Australia, what a finish! 
think I only managed to get uh, or one half or yeah. He dropped the catch, but the throw was good enough, and the runner was not fast enough, so India miss out by one run to tie. The feelings after that match uh, were one of uh, probably more relief than anything else. That you were back in the, in the tournament, um, albeit uh, just. India had lost and was eventually knocked out of the Cricket World Cup, losing three more matches. I think it, it was a case of being in Australia for too long. I don't think they were confident. They were a demoralised lot at that stage and therefore it was no real surprise uh, that they weren't even able to qualify. Uh, having won uh, unexpectedly in 83, there were very high expectations and the country went through quite a depressed phase after 92. India's neighbours and rivals Pakistan arrived in Australia lean and mean under the leadership of their inspirational captain Imran Khan. We were the first team to land in Australia. We played something like 10 matches before and I think uh, that is where Imran was so clever because uh, he uh, wanted to see uh, how the players will shape up to this strange environment because Australia gets to your system. Pakistan's record in the round robin was inconsistent. They lost to the West Indies in their opening game, but then went on to beat Zimbabwe. Next up was England in a game they had to win. The Pakistan match always comes into uh, question because we played at Adelaide in very un-Adelaide conditions, dark, dank, and the ball moved around on, on, on our medium pace and pace bowlers bowled uh, Pakistan out, I think, uh, just over 70 runs. A bit of grass, overcast condition, the ball was seeming around and 74 all out. And I thought to the youngster, okay, that's it for us for this World Cup. They were at the losing end. And then, a divine intervention and they were saved by the bell. Oh, well, they're going off. Well, they finally decided to go off. And we drew the game, we got one point each and eventually that point, one point helped us to qualify for the semi-finals against uh, New Zealand. That match uh, which uh, saved Pakistan, in fact, uh, won the World Cup for them. That point saved Pakistan's campaign and helped them qualify for the semi-finals at the expense of Australia. I remember Imran telling me or telling the team at the time, he said, look, this is God helping us. Australia's Cricket World Cup campaign was not going to plan, having lost their first two games and then defeated India by only one run. Two weeks into the tournament, they faced England and Ian Botham. Something about Australia brings the best out of Beef, he always did. He just loved taking on the Aussies and beating them. Botham striking. No, I wasn't 100% fit because I had a back injury and then coming back from that surgery, I'm never going to be the same cricketer. But I still could do a job. Australia had lost four wickets, but their skipper Alan Border was settling in. Graham Gooch turned to the one player he knew could make a difference, Ian Botham. Bowled a great ball to Alan Balder, if I remember, nicked one back or something and got him bowled. Bowled him! And he gave us this little shuffling dance. Neck and crop. And then he did a strange little thing there, yes, I don't know quite what that was. Yeah, I enjoyed it and also it wound the opposition up. And I used to like winding the opposition up. And that's why they loved him so much. Botham's role as a pinch hitter was finally a revelation. He scored 53 as Australia's attack desperately tried to pin back England's run rate. And that's the sort of thing that Botham will uh, do to try and annoy the Australian bowlers. Throughout your career, you know, some players have the wood over teams and Ian always reserved his best performances for Australia. He got four wickets in that match, if I remember. As you say, took out the captain and uh, took out of the heart of the Australian team. And that's 50 for Ian Botham, and the crowd have enjoyed every one of them. Botham eventually out for 53, but the damage was done, and Australia's chances of reaching the semi-finals were in jeopardy. The Pakistan-South Africa game was one of the most memorable matches of the tournament, not because of the contest, but for one special moment. The South Africa-Pakistan match in Brisbane really grabbed the imagination of the South African public and it always goes back to the John T. Rose dive. We had literally two games left of which we had to win both to qualify. We batted first. It wasn't all from a batting point of view that easy. 
Not easy at all. Skipper Vessels dismissed for seven runs with South Africa on 31. Oh, that's out. Caught behind. Surely a hue. Oh, that's got to be out. The strategy for Wonder Cricket then was totally different to what it is now. From then it was pretty much a build for the first 15 overs, try and not lose wickets, have around 60 after 15. And then because you used two wide balls, reverse swing didn't really come into it. So your, your attacking overs were from, say, over 35 to 50 with wickets in hand. So that, that was how the game was played. South Africa was four for 111 after Mark Rushmere was caught off Mushtag Ahmed. The seam bowlers got some swing. There was like a lot of bounce available. Both teams had good pace attacks. And the game was on the knife edge right throughout. On a lively wicket, South Africa pushed on to a total of 198 with just six and wickets down. Oh, and that should have been caught. It's gone straight through his hands. And this sort of fielding must be driving Imran mad. South Africa eventually scored 211 from their full 50 overs, but was it enough? We were probably 20 or 30 runs short in the last couple of overs because we literally had no idea where the ball was being bowled. Dave Richardson walked off and just went, sorry guys, I must have looked stupid, but I didn't know where the ball was going. South Africa had to attack Pakistan's openers to have any chance of progressing further in the tournament. Their attack was making an impression in a match they had to win. We played really well in defending that title. We bowled well, we fielded well. We realised the strength of the South African team, you know, especially their bowling, because the conditions suited them really well. Inzamar Mulhak was Pakistan's new batting sensation at the 1992 Cricket World Cup. Young and hungry, his batting could turn a game quickly. Oh, he's hit that superbly. Fieldsman can't get it. Superb strike. Inzamar had just entered international arena, and Imran straight away picked him as another match winner. Imran Khan's instincts were correct, and his young protege took on the South African attack with a partnership of 85 alongside his captain, Imran Khan. Inzamam and Imran Khan were batting really well together. They were achieving the required rate. And for us, it was, a, you know, we needed a wicket quite desperately. Punished by the brilliance of youth, flair and experience, South Africa needed a breakthrough. Oh, not interested. Inzamam could be run out. And Jonty Rhodes has demolished the stumps. The run out was, uh, was a typical John T. Rose run out. I was running towards the wicket, tripped over my laces, and some guy took a great picture. The almost feline, low center of gravity. A better man you could not find than John T. Rhodes. He was quite a lumbering runner, so I backed myself to, to beat him to the crease. John T. Rhodes knew there was a chance, decided not to throw. Suddenly I could see out the corner of my eye that he was getting home quicker than I'd anticipated. So for me, the fastest way to get to the stumps over those last two metres was through the air. He gets there first and wipes everything out. You know, it's one of the greatest cricketing moments of all time. You know, that in Zaman run out was the turning point. And that probably turned the game in our favour. Pakistan's batting collapsed after Inzaman was run out and they eventually lost to South Africa in a rain-affected match by 20 runs. South Africa went on to qualify for the semi-finals, winning two of their remaining three matches. They joined New Zealand, who topped the table by winning seven of their eight matches. And England joined them after their solid campaign of five wins and two losses. Pakistan made up the final four by winning all of their remaining three matches, qualifying by one point ahead of Australia and the West Indies. It was exciting. I thought it was brilliantly organised in Australia. Every team played each other once first and the top four went through. I thought that was a very fair way of formatting the tournament. So if you finish in the top four out of those seven games, you deserve to be in the semi-final. semi-final was one of the greatest matches that I have covered in one day cricket. Against New Zealand, we Pakistanis at the time, we were always very confident that we can beat them. They had Imran Khan, they had Wazim Akram, they had Akib Javad, they had pace. The Cricket World Cup had now reached the semi-final stage 
and New Zealand winners of seven out of eight round-robin matches faced Pakistan. From then on, Pakistan was Pakistan, the real Pakistan, under Imran Khan. It's going to be a great battle. A great uh, Wazamak when he's very swiftly comes in for the first ball of the semi-final. We knew that any team playing at home, and if they're on a winning streak, they're bound to lose one because there's so much pressure on them, expectations are so high. Oh, a swing and a miss. Well, there's the nerves for Mark Ratbatch. He's been the star of the bat for New Zealand, along with Martin Crow. There were players within there we knew that could hurt us, but could they handle the pressure? You know, could we beat them um, if we posted a score? Could we defend it? Oh, well, bowled, bowled him, slower ball, you little beauty. That was a magnificent delivery. He's Losing very, Mark Greatbatch was a bit of a dent to us because he was so punishing and uh, he was so damaging to the opposition. And you could see when you lose key players, the opposition's reaction to that. Mark Greatbatch uh, was sensational during that 92 World Cup. We're quite afraid of his, of his calibre and, and the form that he was in, but he was undone by a beautiful slow delivery by Arkin. The match didn't start well for New Zealand, having lost two openers for 39 runs, and it was time for captain Martin Crowe to shine. Beautiful stroke, he just waited on it. Martin Crowe innings is simply outstanding. I mean, best player on the biggest occasion. Uh, and he did it again. And uh, this was Imran Khan, this was Wazir Makram. This is a pretty damn good bowling attack that he manufactured around that day. Martin Crow pulls the first ball away for four. There's no doubt about it, but Martin Crow is in top touch here at Eden Park. Absolutely fearless and, and rising to the occasion. And we run some more there. That's four runs. When you're in Martin Crow's sort of form, that's no problem whatsoever. Champions play the best game when it matters most. And what a game he played. In fact, right throughout the World Cup, he was outstanding. That's gone. Into the stand. Yes, well, Malcolm Crowe is certainly looking to dominate now and has gone for one of the shorter boundaries. New Zealand's run rate gathered pace under the partnership of Crowe and Ken Rutherford, who led a merciless onslaught against the Pakistan attack. This is a tremendous partnership building up here. They really did build this understanding of how to have momentum in it and what we needed to be competitive or what we needed to win. And into the gap and no third man, that'll be four. Imran doesn't know what to do. In the midst of his innings, Martin Crowe became injured but carried on with a runner. Had he pushed himself too far during the tournament? Martin Crowe pulled a hamstring and we didn't know to what extent how bad it was but it was to the point where he needed a runner. And whether that was the stress of having batted so long so often in the tournament uh, had come to pass and it was just too much for his, his body to handle, of course we'll never know, but the fact of the matter is he did. Crow's heroic innings of 91 put his team right back into the match. Eventually, he'd go on to be voted undisputed man of the series. Outstanding innings. Um, there was a player that I liked after Viv Richards it would be Martin Crowe because Martin Crowe was technically so good, side on, stylish player and he would take on, on the opposition, take on fast bowling like nobody else during his era. He was outstanding and what a knock he played. I mean, you know, hitting Vaseem for six over square leg was a special shot. That's got away square and over the top two, that may be six. They played hard and I think best thing happened for us, Martin Crowe got injured while batting, got 90 odd and then he got injured and that helped the cause. 7 for 261. Gavin Larson and Ian Smith were still there as New Zealand reached 262 after 50 overs. Game on. It was 30 more than we thought we needed. And we were pretty confident going into the half-time break, except I had pulled hamstring. Uh, and uh, I had to tell the team that if I was to play in Melbourne, I had to put my, you know, put my hammy up and try and rest it in basically 72 hours. And therefore John Wright had to go out and captain the side. 
262 was a big chase for Pakistan. But Imran Khan, not impressed, and told his team to dig deep. He gave a speech to the boys. He said, look, you've got to strike back like a cornered tiger. A cornered tiger is the one who then attacks. Defining moment when Imran Khan says to his team, come out and fight like cornered tigers. And they did. Martin Crowe's tournament innovation of having spin bowler Dipak Patel open the bowling paid off almost immediately against Pakistan. We'd realised that we had to come up with something different. Warren Lees had left that four brand new balls in my room and said, you know, start having a little tweak with them and see, see how you feel. However, not one to be outdone by tactics, Imran Khan came up with an innovation of his own. And Imran made that massive decision to, to promote himself up the order, batting at number three. Imagine a captain making that decision in the semi-final of the World Cup. He wanted to make a statement, this is me, uh, this is my time, uh, and I'm going to win this World Cup for us. That's it well, that's it hard down to third man. Again, only one run. You know, if you don't disguise it well enough, those guys will eat you for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And he did, and he played some great shots. A little bit of some, you know, but probably didn't quite mean to place it that fine at a third man or whatever, but hey, when it's your day, you're rock and rolling. That's very, very firmly struck through mid on. Pitched up by Danny Morrison. Now he's right, they're not really needing to move his feet much, so it's certainly not deciding to. I was working away nicely with Imran and uh, we got a partnership going and Imran I think it was the first time they did he was batting at Danny Morrison dropping short. Remy's Raj in complete control of his shot. We needed aggression up front because in those days to get a total of uh, 260 was extremely steep. In modern day times it'd be like getting a 300 target. So we had to get going straight away, which we did. And that's and another six. great shot from Imran. Imran Khan taking the offensive. We thought to ourselves, well, we only have to get rid of these guys. Only have to get rid of one of these. We only have to open one end up. But unfortunately, we kept saying that for about 35 overs, you know, and, and, and that makes it too tough. Man's coming back for it. Could be a good catch. It is a super catch. Yes, it was a good innings. Uh, it could have been a lot better. And I played one in the air against the wind and uh, Danny Morrison took a very, very good catch, actually. I distinctly remember going out and there was that, that air of real confidence of saying, well, we're on our way to Melbourne. Ramiz Raja went for 44 with his team 2 for 84. The tactic of holding and getting the innings established had worked. They were led by Imran Khan, now that's power. <laughs> you know, when Imran speaks everyone sort of listens and, and he, he ruled that team. Uh, he went up and down the batting order because he backed himself to be the man. Not giving the batsman too much width. He smashed that one, beautifully hit down the ground. Way up into the terraces, what a magnificent straight six that was. Imran is going to cut loose. You know, you're playing 50 over cricket and it gets dominated by batsmen, really. And on that pitch was a bit like, for a lot of those guys, playing in Pakistan. You know, it was brown, it was shaven, it was pretty benign, and pace off the ball was ideal. At that point, Javed Meandad stepped in to partner Imran Khan. Good shot. Beautifully placed by Meander, that's four. But there was a problem with Pakistan's premier batsman. A month or two before the World Cup, he got uh, used to eating betel nuts and chewing tobacco, which really damages inside the membrane of his stomach. Every time he ran a single or a couple of runs, he would uh, crouch on the ground, he would get hold of the handle of the bat, and he always looked in pain. Imran Khan was eventually caught by Chris Harris. His impact on the match had been huge and cued Javed Meandad to join Inzamamul Haq in a match-winning partnership. 
Inzamam was struggling. I think early on in the World Cup, he batted at number three. But Imran and we all knew how great talent he is. So Imran said, okay, instead of him batting at number three, I'll go at number three. He should come at number five or six because then ball will be slightly older and he'll be able to play. He showed in that semi-final, the inning he played, he got 50 out of 30 balls and he won us a game out of nowhere. Well, it's between the two fielders. Just four, and this guy is a dangerous batsman. Us match me, just me batting करने जा रहा था. In that match, when I was batting, Imran advised me to play my natural game. So I played my natural game. Javid, who was at the other end, told me to defend a few as well and occupy the crease. He was the senior player in 1992. It's gone right over that fielder for a moment. Would have thought the wind was going to hold it up. The way he played the innings, you know, it was total aggression, sensational hitting against the wind. You know, uh, wind can be a real problem for bowlers and batsmen in New Zealand, but, um, you know, he just Took it, took it to a different level in Inzi in that innings. Brilliant. Inzamam al Haq played the innings of his life, but it nearly didn't happen, but for the brilliant captaincy of Imran Khan. That's four. Take it away. Inzi was throwing up all the night before. He didn't want to go and bat. Oh, he's got that one away right into the middle of the gap. Four. So it was a big blow because Imran always felt that uh, Inzi had the talent to pull it off. I think the odds are certainly in favour of Pakistan at the moment. Imran had basically to force him. He's got that one away too, exactly the same place. Imran wrote down the playing 11 without the name of Inza Mamul Haq. Just as he was about 10 yards uh, outside the dressing room, came back again and and asked Inzi. He said to me that no matter how sick you are feeling, you'll have to play. I, of course, obliged. I took a few breaks during my innings against New Zealand to help me, but to begin with, I didn't think I'd be playing at all. But Imran had confidence in me, and he thought if I scored, our team would win. Pakistan was on four for 227 when Inzaman was run out. Oh, and that's got him! He's got him! He's got him! Inzaman Al-Haq is out run out. They have tried it once too often. That was a crucial body blow to us that he came out and did it so quickly. It put pressure on our bowlers where they hadn't had pressure. It made us change the bowling plans, which we hadn't done before in the field placings. And it was an innings of real brilliance. The target was now in sight. All Pakistan had to do was pass it. It's called it. Man out there at square leg. He's defending. It's going fine. It could go all the way. It's coming around quickly. We die. That's four runs. And Pakistan have won the first semi final at Eden Park. A magnificent performance by Jarvan Mian down into the Nohawk. And against Pakistan in that semi-final, they just wanted it more. But that game was the ultimate. I think I couldn't sleep for about a couple of days after winning the semi-final. Still shell shocked that we have qualified for the finals. Pakistan was through to their first ever Cricket World Cup final. For their captain, the ambition to win it went beyond the sport that he loved. My motivation was not personal ambitions or uh, you know personal success my my driving force was that I we needed to win the World Cup to build the cancer hospital The second semi-final of the 1992 Cricket World Cup took place at the famous Sydney Cricket Ground. For the South African team, it had been a journey of great pride and joy. 
That was the incredible thing about playing in 1992. Even though there wasn't yet a democracy, there was so much support from the entire country. The reception from everybody across all um, cultures and, and races was incredible. And I think that support had been throughout the tournament. Apartheid had kept South Africa out of international sport for two decades. The man who played an influential role in ending apartheid was the former Australian Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. I think the fact that we did lead the fight against apartheid and I recognise the role of Australia, I think that gives them a feeling of particular warmth towards Australia. So there is, I think, underlying, even if it's not, even if it's not openly expressed, I think there's an underlying affection for Australia because of that. And uh, we both play um, now aggressive cricket uh, and uh, attractive cricket. It was an exciting time for South Africa, now back playing international cricket. Their team was led by Kepler Vessels at the 1992 ICC Cricket World Cup. Well, a very special time from a South African sporting point of view. Back uh, for the first time after so many years into a, a big international event. So it was daunting at the same time, but uh, it was also very exciting. No one knew much about the South African team per se going into the 92 World Cup, uh, but we knew a fair bit about Kepler Vessels. You know, me personally, I played uh, with Kepler um, here in Queensland and obviously for Australia for a number of, number of years, so I knew that They'd be a very well prepared and disciplined uh, cricket team. The South Africans lit up the round robin stage, winning five of their eight matches. The highlight being Jonty Rhodes' unforgettable run out of Inzamarmel Huck. Umpire not interested. Inzamarm could be run out. And Jonty Rhodes has demolished the stumps. Well, we started really well. And once we'd beaten Pakistan, we beat Zimbabwe, and, and we were really, we were really on a roll. Welcome to the SCG for the uh, second semi between England and South Africa. Kepler, uh, not too worried about the, the rain? Yeah, it is a calculated risk, but um, you know, if it rains while we're bowling, it's not too bad. It's a problem comes in if you're batting tonight and it rains. It's going to be a good game. The weather conditions look a bit suspect, but uh, you know, you can't worry about that. You've got to get on with it. In the air and wide there, if that had been a third slip, he would have taken a catch, however, a good delivery. We didn't have our best day at the tournament. Uh, I won the toss under helpful conditions, decided to bowl first, which, which was a good decision. But we just weren't uh, as good as we were with the ball during different times in that tournament. Good shot, straight down the ground. That's what he's there for. England's openers settled in early with Ian Botham, enjoying his role as a pinch hitter. Send out to get on with it. It was an ageing team. Uh, we were, a few of us getting, well, I was certainly well into the twilight of my career. Um, and the body was finished, but, but I still could do a job. So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Oh, well, bold, being appealed there for court behind. He's given him out. He's given him out. That didn't look back. Gooch is on his way. It was a tight game. South Africa always tough to beat. You know, very competitive, in-your-face type cricketers. South Africa rattled Ian Botham, who lost his wicket not long after Graham Gooch. England was in trouble early in their innings at 39 for two. Graham Hick then stepped in and got a lucky call. Kepler of Pessels uh, nearly had a heart attack there at first slip. We bowled uh, a few wides, a few no balls. One of those no balls resulted in, in me catching Graham Hick at first slip when he was on naught. So that was very expensive, a mistake that cost us, uh, cost us dearly. It was tough luck. Hick's partnership of 71 with Alex Stewart helped push England's run rate up and gave them the advantage. Into the uh, pitch and bounced straight over Jonty Rhodes' head. Got him. Brilliantly done. Alex Stewart was dismissed for 33. I always felt we were winning that game. That was the thing. And what people do forget is that South Africa slowed down their overrate when they were bowling. And I think they only bowled, was it 45, 46 overs top whack? South Africa's slow run rate didn't deter England's middle order, who scored impressively to keep their run rate up. 
Got that way square. That'll be four. Good shot. So I think we had a pretty decent attack. Graham Hick really played well. I mean, there weren't many people scoring at a strike rate of close to 100 in limited overs cricket in, way back in 1992. We weren't expecting to bowl them out for 200. I mean, they were a good, England were a good side. If they got going, we knew that. But there was that lovely touch of class about his play. And no better example than that stroke away through extra cover. South Africa's slow overrate continued as Hick was dismissed for 83. John De Rhodes in the way and anything close to him is going to be hauled down as he pulled that one down two-handed. Eventually at 6.10 p.m. the scheduled close of play for the first innings the players were called off the field after 45 overs. It's gone again that could be six that's a big long hit just bounces over the fence great over for England. 250 was a good score and with a good bowling side, you know, with our variety and our fielding was good as well, we thought we could protect that, so we were confident. And the players coming off the ground after 45 overs, that's a disappointing aspect. They only received 45 overs, but England have done very well, 6 for 252. In the end, I still felt that uh, we restricted England to a total that we could get. And uh, our run chase... Uh, our run chase wasn't a bad one, we were, we were sort of on target. Rain was always going to be a problem. Those words proved ominous as South Africa began their run chase. Welcome back to the SCG. Well, we've got a game on our hands here. Even though they were only permitted 45 overs by the South Africans, 6 for 252 England, that's a terrific score. And I can tell you it'll be no easy target for the South Africans to reach. Very loose delivery from Lewis. Put away for four. England's first breakthrough came when Kepler Vessels was dismissed with South Africa's score on 26. He's gone. That's the wicket that England wanted. Kepler Vessels up for 17. It's one for 26. England's supporters, who were getting a name for themselves as the Barmy Army, had more joy when Dangerman Peter Kirsten went next. What a delivery! What a blow for England. The Freitas has removed the danger man for South Africa. The big scorer in this World Cup, Peter Kirsten. It is the Freitas. With South Africa wobbling at two for 61, England's fans went wild. The Brahmi army actually probably started in, during, in that, 19, that World Cup in 1992. These guys follow us around all over. Gone straight down to square leg, it's going to be out, it's well held, not a problem at all. Graham Hick, Gladstone Small has earned this wicket. Jonty Rhodes stepped in to post South Africa's second highest score of 43 just when they needed it. Long way to carry down there. And finally South Africa reached the boundary. I got 40 odd in the game, but um, I don't remember how I got them. I slashed a couple over sort of slips and inside edged a few to mid wickets and ran really hard. I mean, it's a big, it's a big field at Sydney at the SCG. And there was a lot of runs available. Um, I think we'd been bogged down a bit in, in the sort of middle period, so the run rate had, had gone up quite high. Again, he's gone for this time. Lewis is underneath. He's going to catch it. Rhodes was eventually out, but South Africa was going steadily. David Richardson joined Brian McMillan to maintain the momentum. We had Brian McMillan to wicket, David Richardson, they were going quite well. The game could have gone either way. Fairbrother again, throws wide, he's safe behind. Excellent running, South Africa still in this match. And the rain came. Well, the situation is, uh, we're in the 43rd over. At the end of 42, South Africa would need 251. At the end of 43, South Africa would need 252. It was only 12 minutes of rain, but it was enough to ruin South Africa's hopes of reaching the final, in an incident that eventually led to the introduction of the Duckworth-Lewis system. As the rain started to fall, I knew we were in trouble because I knew exactly how the calculation was going to go. And uh, once we'd been off the field for like 10 or 12 minutes, whenever we went back in on, we, we were going to struggle. And, and that's exactly what happened, which, uh, which was unfortunate. When play resumed, South Africa's batsmen Brian McMillan and Dave Richardson were confronted by this. The scoreboard has gone up that South Africa need 22 to win from seven balls. There was confusion even on the scoreboard. And Ian Chappell has some further information. 
Yes, Richie, uh, we've got a strange situation here because Alan Jordan has just come back to me and said that the, uh, the umpires have come back to him and they've changed it to say that there is only one ball remaining. One day cricket, as you know, there's a time span for it, there's time allocated and you can't go over that time. And of course, when it came to the end of the match, when it was really close and there was a bit of a rain delay and whatever and the recalculation come out and they wanted 22 off one ball, uh, everyone said what ridiculous rain delay, but people do forget what happened earlier in the game. When they are under pressure, they slowed it down. The Bruins have no sympathies for South Africa because they use it as a tactic, they're entitled to do that. Um, did it penalise them in the end? Probably. Now it's a disappointing in comes Chris Lewis to bowl the final delivery. It's pushed away to mid-wicket. You can see that all the players are disappointed with that end. The crowd will roar here at the Sydney Cricket Ground. So at the end, it's England and a disappointing finish to a wonderful match. Disappointed Brian McMillan, Captain of Vessels, the manager Ray Jordan there. The South Africans have played very well at the end, the weather beat them. Well the end of the match was very emotional. Uh, it was the end of well, a two month stint of uh, full of pressure and full of uh, highlights and, and, and a few disappointments as well. So for it to come down to what was amounted to 22 runs of, uh, of one delivery was, uh, was naturally devastating. But the only thing I really remember was Mary Pringle standing on the side of the sort of outside the dressing room at the SCG holding the banister and tears literally. He was crying. South Africa, they got to the semi final and they told everybody we're back and we're here to stay. And they played the game with a lot of flair, a lot of thought, and they were a definite plus point for world cricket and for that tournament. So England, the victors here at the SCG in the second semi final of the Benson Hedges World Cup of 1992. We say goodbye from the Sydney Cricket Ground. England through to their second consecutive Cricket World Cup final. All that stood between them was Imran Khan and his cornered Tigers. When I got Alan Lamb, and I think me and Pakistan team thought, in fact the whole Pakistan thought at the time, the World Cup is ours. Melbourne, Australia was the final destination for the 1992 Cricket World Cup. The host city welcomed both the England and Pakistan teams after a dinner reception that didn't go quite to plan. There was about 600, 800 people there. Both teams there the night before the final compulsory. It just wouldn't happen and uh, it shouldn't have happened then. We went along to it. When you're preoccupied, you want all you're thinking about is the final the next day and we paraded in, sat down, and then um, in the wisdom of Creed Australia, they decided to have this uh, comedian on. It was her intention to privatise my whole family. About as funny as... Uh, anyway, we won't go into that. Apparently, we were to become known as the Foster's royal family. My head's on spinning anyway, so I don't want to be there. And I'm thinking about the final, I just said, I, I don't need this. And I got up and walked out. And myself and Ian, obviously very proud of our heritage, of our country, of our Queen and all it stands for. We thought it was completely in bad taste and we just got out and when he was performing we just walked straight out. And I remember very clearly that Imran looked over at the stage and had a bit of a chuckle saying, look, it's only the Colonials that are left. It was myself, born in Barbados, Dermot Reef born in Hong Kong, Chris Lewis born in Diana, Robert Smith born in South It's only the Colonials that was left in the, in the room uh, uh, 10 minutes into this show. As we went down the staircase to get in the cars to go to the ground for the final, the world's press was there. But then Prime Minister Paul Keating had said, well, I don't like impersonators probably any more than the English cricketers do, but I mean, that's their problem. And I just turned and said, well, I'm very proud of my heritage and my country, and like you, we have a heritage. And that made me feel a bit better. This was England's third World Cup final and Pakistan's first. For both teams, it was a nervous occasion. I woke up early. I had early night, obviously, with the World Cup final. You, you know, you're not supposed to have a late night anyway. It's a World Cup final. <laughs> it's the ultimate dream for any sports person. You, you try and treat it, you know, we all said, try and treat it as just another game. Well, it, it was more than just another game, obviously, because you don't get to too many World Cup finals. Pakistan's appearance owed much to their inspirational captain, Imran Khan. His leadership and man management skills had gelled together a tight unit of committed and competitive players, 
who had one goal to win the Cricket World Cup. Imran was an extremely honest leader and picked the team on merit. I was having breakfast in the morning and I saw the newspaper. I went straight to the sports page and the heading was, I want Vaseem to bowl fast. I want him to bowl express. And that was coming from Imran Khan. That gave me so much confidence as a young cricketer. When Imran backed you, it meant you played. When Imran said, sorry, you're not going to make it to the playing 11, we knew that even if we went anywhere for help, we'll not get it because Imran was the last, last word on everything when he was the captain. Imran Khan had inspired his team to play like cornered tigers throughout the tournament. I see you got your tiger on again. You want them to play like cornered tigers? Yes, I, that's, the, that's the motto recently and they've done a great job. You know, they've played like tigers, especially the younger boys, you know. They haven't been overawed by any situation. He got us in in a corner. He said, I want you to fight like this. I said, fight like what, Skipper? He said, fight like corner tigers. You know what happens when tiger gets cornered? He attacks back. Pakistan now faced England in the final at the famous Melbourne Cricket Ground. Led by Graham Gooch, England had been one of the strongest sides throughout the tournament. We had a good team of experienced cricketers. There was no novices in our team. They'd all been playing for a number of years. We had a lot of skill and depth. Uh, we'll bat. I still remember Imran Khan telling us when he had come out uh, after doing the toss that uh, the captain looked just a little bit nervous and it was Graham Good. We are delighted to be here in front of the full house of Melbourne. It's our object to reach the World Cup final. We obviously like to win it, but we hope it's a good game of cricket. The World Cup final 1992. 88,000 or whatever it was at the MCG. I'm not sure how many Australians are actually supporting England. I think they're probably more siding on the side of Pakistan because of the Australian-England rivalry anyway. But we had good support. We had really good support. The match did not start well for Pakistan. They were 2 for 24 when Derek Pringle, one of England's most consistent bowlers, lined up Ramiz Raja. And I felt, you know, with, with the two new balls that were swinging, I was, I was a threat and it's always nice to feel that. Yes, looked as though it had to be desperately close. Steve Buckner took his time. I still feel that the ball that hit me and got me out leg before wicket was a little high because it hit my thigh. Perhaps the only doubt about the height of the ball, but Steve Buckner deciding the ball was on target. After that, Pakistan's two most senior players, Imran Khan, the captain, and his deputy, Javed Miandad, dug in. Quite frankly, they'd been rivals. There was no love loss at all. There was deep mutual respect, but also indefinitely edge, big edge. Really trying to consolidate here. That long partnership between Javed and Imran, it's such an extraordinary partnership. They lose some early wickets, and Javed and Imran going along at one or two and over. Imran Khan allows himself a wry grin. Him and Mia that blocked, blocked, blocked. This is a one-day final. Obviously, the idea was to have wickets in hand. During that partnership, Derek Pringle had two appeals for LBW against Javid turned down. And there's another one which must be very close, and the Englishmen are astonished this time as well. It was a brave decision. Uh, yes, that LBW, but <laughs> you always get your heart in your mouth when you appeal for an LBW. It looked out. It looked out at the time as well. I did think they were pretty adjacent. Two against Javid, but um, you know, Steve Buckner ruled that they weren't. You gotta go with their decision. Sometimes it works for you, sometimes it don't. It got worse for England when their captain Graham Gooch dropped Imran Khan on nine. Later, he went on to score a crucial 72 runs. A difficult swirling catch for Graham Gooch. He skied a ball to me at mid wicket and I, I didn't get a hand on it really, which was a crucial moment in the game. And the rub of the green and little breaks that you need to turn matches didn't go for us and it went for them. The gutsy Javid continued to give crucial support in a brave innings. Before the start of the match, he had ignored medical advice to play. I think the doctor has advised him not to play. And yet, uh, because Miyadad being Miyadad, he said, no, I will play no matter what happens to me. 
And this time to the left, Javid Miandad may be distressed out there by illness, but he still can put away a full toss. I mean, he was struggling, Imran was struggling. He had a bad shoulder in, during the World Cup. He used to take injection in his shoulders, painkillers, and he, he bowled. But again, these guys were the true greats of the game. Well, he's got that one away beautifully. Nice and fine, that'll be four. Yeah, they turned the game, really, and Javid Miandad, supreme street-fighting batsman, a guy you'd, you'd probably put your money on to bat for your life. Javid's problem worsened during the innings, so he had to call for a runner as he continued with Imran. The partnership was worth a vital 139 runs before the sick Javid was out for 58. And Javid has gone to the reverse sweep to both them at point. And Ellingworth gets the wicket and Javid Miandad, who for the last half an hour or so of his innings has been distressed and needed a runner. Those guys dug deep for their country and they put in a performance that made the difference. With Javid gone, semi-final hero, ace batsman and raw talent Inza Huck was again inspirational. Inzi, you see, was really the spirit of Pakistan cricket at the time. He had to come from, he didn't have a good education, you know, he, he came from a very poor background. He was the spirit and the quintessence, he, the, the boiled down essence of what Pakistan cricket at that moment represented. Inzamam's exciting batting inspired the MCG crowd, who really got behind him. And once more for the Pakistanis, Inzamam is the man. It was amazing how suddenly all these Australian supporters who bought tickets thinking their team was going to be in the final. Sorry about that. They weren't, were you? They actually suddenly all became Pakistani supporters. So we felt we actually, we thought we were, we were playing in Karachi. I don't know about uh, the MCG, but it was terrific atmosphere. It was Ian Botham who ended Imran Khan's incredible innings of 72 with Pakistan at four for 197. And Imran, who has batted so well, for his 70, finally goes. That really was the critical uh, innings uh, because that partnership got Pakistan first out of trouble and then allowed the likes of Inzi and Wasim Akram to come and blast the opposition. That's a good hit. That's going all the way through mid wicket for four. I got 33 of 18. Inzi got 30 plus, about 15 deliveries. So in the end, we got to 249. It was an Akram we run out, so after 50 overs, Pakistan R6 for 249. Imran Khan had inspired his team with his batting. Now it was time for his bowlers to take the fight to England. He was still able to galvanise those around him. And in particular, Wazi Makran, who he told not to worry about no balls. Just bowl as fast as you can. He's given both them. Well, both them, uh, I think I can say without any fear of contradiction, is far from impressed by that. I was given that caught behind off my shirt. Pakistan crowd think it's marvellous. Things just didn't go right in that final. There's a loud appeal from Pakistan. Was him given the benefit of the doubt? When we got beefy out, I couldn't hear anything. I just heard the bit of noise. I went with the appeal and so did the team. I actually was quite furious and it was one of the best cricket bats I've had in my career and I actually smashed it splinters in the dressing. I got nicked for me and Botham and he still says he didn't nick it. Botham uh, is far from impressed. I was furious um, because you've worked so hard for that moment. Botham out for a duck in his last Cricket World Cup was soon followed by Alex Stewart. Oh, he's on his way, he's caught behind. Stewart turned and walked away. He knew it was all over. It was tough, it was really tough. And we got off to a slow start. Um, their bowling attack was, was pretty special. I would say they could swing the, swing the new ball well. After the loss of both Graham Hick and Graham Gooch, England was 69 for four. Neil Fairbrother and Alan Lamb launched an impressive recovery. So Imran Khan turned to his strike bowler. Wasim Akram was a wicket taker. I did not want him to bowl as a run container. I wanted to use his overs to take wickets. 
I remember that delivery I bowled to Alan Lamb. He was planned. There were two balls, remember, two white balls each end. And uh, I think Imran said this partnership is building up. Two top one day players are batting. So we need a wicket. What a great delivery. Left arm around the wicket. Alan Lamb has been cleaned up. Perhaps so too England. You've got to admire the skills, haven't you? You've, you've got to marvel at those skills. And those sort of little passages play turn the game. When I got Alan Lamb, and I think me and Pakistan team thought the World Cup was ours. Next up was Chris Lewis, who stepped into Wazim Akram's line of fire. A defining moment in the match for the tournament's best bowler. I wanted him to bowl fast and to get us breakthroughs. I had a chat with Imran at mid -on. He said, in swing length. Your brother is still there. Subtract Lewis from that list. Wazim Akram is on a hat-trick. I can't forget Chris Lewis when he bowled uh, in dipper, quick one, coming off the wicket so quick. I think Vaseem had that art. I think he's the one of the best left arm seam bowler I ever seen. He bowled fantastically well. He was in good rhythm. He was uh, happy bowling quick, and then he was bowling with control as well. It was a devastating spell that tore the England middle order apart. From then on, there wasn't much resistance, particularly after Neil Fairbrother was dismissed for a defiant 62. Is it in the air? Surely this must be out. Keep it coming around, Moen Khan. He's got it. That could be the World Cup. As a unit, we clicked brilliantly, and in, in, in important matches, we got our egg together. With Pakistan poised for victory, Imran Khan bowled the final ball of the 1992 Cricket That's World Cup. Yeah, he's getting under it. This could be victory. It is. Pakistan win the World Cup. A magnificent performance in front of 87,000 people. Imran Khan has led his side to victory. What a great victory. It was the greatest moment uh, for Pakistan. Well, the Pakistani players in prayer on the ground to give thanks for their victory. After 15 years of being rivals, uh, representing different cultures, and there's this embrace between Javed and Imran. And if you read Javed's wonderful, very generous autobiography, he says, you know, it was too deep for words, it was beyond words what was going on between us. The 1992 World Cup has been an outstanding success. There's two ways of looking at it. It's disappointment, reaching the final, losing all three. Some pride, only played in three. We reached the final in all three. So we must have been doing something right. If you want me to pick an image of the World Cup, it was Imran Khan holding the trophy, because that was a mission. You mustn't drop it. Thank you very much. If he had the best captain I played under, that I can promise you. He believed in hard work, and if you do hard work, you'll eventually succeed. That was his mantra, and we followed his mantra all the way during that World Cup. I would just like to say that I feel very proud that at the twilight of my career, finally I managed to win the World Cup. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imran Khan. Congratulations, Pakistan. That's all from down here.